Welcome. I am Mrs. Neal, the Educator Advocate. I am very excited that you are here. I am very big on practicality. I appreciate leaving professional developments with specific strategies that I can take back into my classroom or into my life and actually apply them. So as you are going through this free webinar, it is my, I hope, that you leave not only inspired, but also with at least one specific strategy that you can take back with you and apply, learn from, look it up, uh, grow, um, use it to benefit you how it needs to benefit you. I know that we are all busy people. So if you must, you can listen while on the go, but if you can grab a notepad and a pencil and let's begin. Before we begin, I want to give you the opportunity to meet me. Again, I am Allison Neal. I'm the voice that you'll be hearing throughout this session. I'm currently an instructional coach, and I created this webinar so that you can get an idea of or just be refreshed about what education is about, um, some of the things that you may have to deal with, and some strategies to take with you to the classroom. My first, first few years of education, of teaching, was very revelatory. It's my hope that my story, my experiences, the experiences of other people that you will hear about um, in today's session, this webinar today as a whole just leaves you inspired to do great and to be great. I'll remind you again later, but you are a great person. Um, educators are great people. We are chosen people. You don't know it yet, but there is a power in you. There is a purpose just for you. Your purpose and my purpose, they are two different things. But I have to tap into my purpose and you have to tap into yours. Educators, again, we are truly chosen people and we must all put in the work to protect us all. So this is just my attempt to put in the work to help you as you journey through life as an educator. When you click out of this video, you have specific ways that your next year of education is more successful than the last one. Or if you're new, these are just great tips to get you started in education. Please know that this is not, is not the end all be all and there is so much more information out there for you to go and get. Today, I'll just go over some highlights, some most in common issues in regards to education and some easy ways that can make your next school year better. Before I get started, I wanna talk about three extraordinary women in education who are accomplished and who have taken education and really used it to live out there life purpose. So let's meet Dr. Marquita Blades. Listen as I share Dr. Blades' story with you as it relates to her first years in education. Here's what she had to say. My first year in education in the classroom were more about learning how to navigate school building dynamics rather than focusing on the practice of teaching. My very first year, I took a job at the school where I students taught because I thought it was a good sign that they'd value all that a new teacher would bring to the table. I learned quickly, though, that new ideas and approaches to learning were not welcomed. Teachers had their own years of experience and often tried to transpose those onto new teachers. My second year at a new school was a little better in terms of culture and climate amongst my colleagues. However, the attitude towards being accepting of new ideas and new ways of doing things was not very different. I had to learn how to be comfortable doing my own thing while still being compliant with school and department expectations. This was Dr. Blade's experience starting out as a new educator. Now I wanna share with you what Dr. Blaze feels would have made it better for her during her first years of education in the classroom. Having a better understanding of the building culture would have helped a lot. 
I also should have interviewed more. I took the first position I was offered because it was in a great school district where positions were hard to come by. Nowadays, new teachers have far more options and I recommend they exercise them all. Find a place with the type of students, families, and community members that speak to who you are as a professional. All of those things matter and make a difference in how you are able to show up as a teacher. Y'all, those words are so true and I hope you find inspiration in those words. Next, we have Dr. Lindsay Jensen. She was the 2018 Illinois Teacher of the Year and has recently made Bright Beam's list of top 21 rising women in education in the year 2021. What an accomplishment, especially post-pandemic. Let's hear what Dr. Jensen had to say in regards to her first year teaching. She says that my first year in the classroom, I was just struggling to keep my head above water. I remember eating pizza in my classroom at 9 p.m. at least three nights a week. I said yes to every extracurricular activity because I wanted to build relationships with the students outside of my classroom but I remember feeling incredibly overwhelmed. I spent my entire weekends grading essays. I didn't see my friends or make time for family. I stopped exercising in the morning and slept in due to exhaustion. I was a mess. It took me years to truly understand what was required for work-life balance, but it's an absolute necessity to understand in order to remain in the profession. Initially, I felt like I had to be available at all times for my students and for their families. What I've realized is that in order to be at my best for my students, I have to take care of myself. And how I spent my first year was not sustainable or healthy. In my early years, I felt like I was constantly pushing the boundaries of what a 24-hour day could hold. Now I know better. That was Dr. Jensen's experience starting out as a new educator. Now I want to share with you what Dr. Jensen feels would have made those few years better for her. Here's what she had to say. Like most first year teachers, the only thing I wanted was to not get fired. I wanted to be asked back the following year. Consequently, I didn't maintain healthy boundaries and I was a complete workaholic. What would have helped me was a mentor who encouraged me to take time for myself and to understand that it wasn't selfish to engage in self-care. In fact, doing so would make me better for my students. Again, I want to stress that these words are so true, just as Dr. Blade's words, and I hope that you find inspiration in these words as well. Lastly, but not least, I want you to meet Cindy Lumpkin. Cindy has been successful at opening her own educational center for students with disabilities, such an amazing and needed thing to do. In regards to her first year of teaching, she says that it was just plain horrible. So many teachers have this first same year, uh, first experience for their first year of just a horrible school year or a horrible couple of school years. When asked what would have made it better for her, she mentioned the idea of having a mentor, just as Dr. Jensen did. Someone who she could just connect with and feel comfortable going to and asking for questions or other concerns. It is my hope to provide you with some information that prevents you from having the same experiences that many of us have during our first years of experience in education. Even if you don't get the opportunity to connect with a mentor, I hope this video finds you and gives you the opportunity to go into the next school year, no matter what uh, year this is for you, with a bit more confidence. So we're gonna start off with some things that you can look forward to in the field of education. For many of you, you may already be aware of these things. So we're gonna tackle them head on. 
Many educators can attest to the fact that there is pressure to perform in education, performance pressures, depending on your subject area, such as math or ELA or science, or your performance area, such as co coaching a team. That pressure can vary. So I'll take me for example. I've been a math educator and an ELA um, tutor for many years. In both areas, I feel pressure. Data is a big thing in schools. And teachers sometimes get shamed or feel ashamed when the data isn't up to par. I do understand and I do know that data is important. It drives our instructions. And sometimes it really does take for us to get our feelings out of the way, move ourselves out of the way, and keep in mind that the growth of our students is what's most important and is what's expected of us, even when children don't understand this. That sounds and can feel so unfair. When a child is misbehaving, we're still expected to deliver results. The frustration that it can cause can be overwhel uh, overwhelming for some, especially when you aren't in the mental health space that you that you should be in or could be in to be able to just reflect and to make changes off of those reflections that benefit the situation. Performance pressures makes it hard for us to feel like we're hitting the target in the classroom. Students, parents, admin, oh my. This is a loaded statement. As educators, we really have a lot to balance. We have the students. We have their parents. Then we have the pressures of admin, not to mention our own personal lives. That sometimes can be a little bit overwhelming. Sometimes involves husbands, sometimes involves children. With students, they are also different and have different needs from us. Some of them need us to give them space. Some of them need for us to be a second mom. Some of them need for us to give them tough love sometimes. Then we have the parents, and I speak from experience when I say that these are probably my least favorite people to deal with sometimes. Now, there are great parents, and I've had a bunch of great parents, but sometimes they can be nails in our throne. Then we have the admin and even others who are in leadership positions that can make our jobs more difficult. This could be from lack of support. This could be from just not liking how we do things. Remember Dr. Blades, she told us about how her colleagues, they just really didn't wanna accept new ways of doing things. They were stuck in how they were doing it, making it harder for her. The reasons are endless, but juggling all of these things can make it feel impossible to hit the target. As educators, we are pushed and we are pulled, expected to do this and expected to do that. The way that the day of an educator flows varies depending on what school you're at, what city you're in, what state you're in. I remember my first year as a teacher, I had a great experience with time as it relates to my planning period. My planning time was sacred. Sometimes I just use this time to debrief to reflect on the last class, various things. The point is that I had this time to renew myself and it was valued, not only by me, but by those around me, those in the school building. Not everyone has this experience. I've talked to teachers who have had to cover other classes during their planning times, especially with this trend of quitting teachers and lack of substitutes. So some educators are experiencing lack of not only having time to refresh and debrief, but they're also experiencing not having time to plan, to actually plan their, lesson, their lessons, which then spills over into their home lives, which can just cause frustration, can cause stress, um, especially if they have families to care, care about or to care for and to be there for at home. I think about Dr. Jensen's words as she spoke on this topic. She didn't take the time she needed because of the demands of her job, the demands of teaching. Driving distance. So my first year, I drove almost an hour to work. But this also plays a part in 
not having enough time to get things done. Dealing with the lack of time can make it feel impossible to hit the target. Diverse learning needs. In a classroom, no matter the grade or even the subject, you are guaranteed to have a classroom where every student's needs and or their way of learning is different. Even if you're in an advanced class where everybody in the class is considered smart, they all still have different learning needs. One child may like to be just given the notes and then have the time to study on their own. Another child may need to get up and to move to actually retain the information that you're trying to get through to them. Another child may need visuals. They may need you to demonstrate. They may need pictures um, in order to grasp the information. The needs are various. In a classroom, catering to these needs are important and it makes a difference to whether students are successful or not successful. Dealing with diverse learners in a classroom, especially when you are not effectively trained, can make it feel difficult and even impossible to hit the target. In most public schools, in most all public school districts, testing is a major part of a teacher's life. Schools are rated based on tests. Districts are rated based on tests. This can be stressful for all those involved, including the students. Although it can be stressful, teachers are still expected to perform and get results while ensuring that students understand the importance and even sometimes trying to convince students of the importance. And let's be honest, some of them, for many reasons, could care less about tests. The pressures of testing can make it feel impossible to hit the target. Student discipline and behaviors. Now, this is an interesting one. As with all of the things that educators go through, all of the things that you may face, it really depends on various factors, such as the culture of the school, where you are, some of the laws that your state or school district has, and while it depends on all of these things, it's also safe to say that times are changing and so are the students. We are truly dealing with a new breed of children when it comes to their behaviors and their discipline. It's just different from when you and I were in school for the most part. Sometimes we have to deal with children who are just not used to being held accountable at home. So when they come to school, they're bringing that same reality to school. They're not being held accountable. So why should they be held accountable at school? This is their train of thought. And this makes it difficult. This makes it stressful for the teacher. Sometimes um, school leaders, they're just, they're swamped with things to do. And the discipline issues, what we see as discipline issues as educators, they don't see because they have a bigger picture. They have other things that they're worried about that don't include the small day-to-day -day disciplinarian issues that we may be sending students to the office for or that you may be sending students to the office for. So sometimes this can be stressful for a teacher when they see a student come back with the lollipop or with the smile on their face because there just may be a disconnect between administration or the school leadership team and the teachers, making it feel hard to hit the target as a classroom teacher. Now, considering all of the previously discussed topics, dealing with these things year after year, after year, after year can cause one to feel burned out to feel as if the classroom is just not the place for them anymore, to feel like they want to leave the field of education altogether, um, sometimes for a less stressful job, sometimes for a job with the same amount of money or, the, or more or even less amount of money with less stress and perhaps maybe even more support. For some, this becomes a reality for them. They, they actually leave. They 
can't afford to do so. For some others, they have to stay in the profession because they feel like they have no way out, causing them to do what some people call a trending topic right now is quietly quit or quitting quietly or just give their bare minimum until they can exit stage left. This burnout can plague a school, it can plague a district, it can plague a state, and to be honest, it can and plague it can plague an entire country as in my opinion what we are seeing today when we look around. Last but not least, we have funding. Now, this varies depending on where you are. Take me for instance. I live in Mississippi. Enough said. But you may live in other states like Texas or Maryland, places where teachers get paid much higher. In Mississippi, teachers get what is called EEF money to buy supplies and other needed materials at the beginning of the school year. This can be a decent amount for teachers. And this probably varies from state to state, state to state, but it's not enough to get through the entire year, especially for brand new teachers. When teachers are dealing with the things that they deal with that cause burnout, on top of not being paid for the hard work that they feel that they're pushing out, it can cause them to feel as if it's impossible to hit the target. While we all want to hit the target in every part of our lives, I know and I want you to know that it's about the journey there. You should leave this session with practical ways to help you along the journey as an educator. I want you to leave feeling like you can hit the target throughout your journey in whatever way that looks like for you. Self-care. I put this first because it's probably, in my opinion, the most important. Remember Dr. Jensen, phenomenal teacher. She had to learn this the hard way. I was just like her. I found it hard to leave work at work. I had this uh, rolling bag. It was a black and white rolling bag that my parents had bought me um, out of college. and I would take it to and from work every day. And there were many a days that that bag never got touched when I made it home. But the things that needed to be done inside that bag were on my mind the entire time. On top of that, I had a family to take care of when I got home that needed my attention as well. Not to mention that when I would leave work, I would be tired, like many of you have been or will be. You are teaching the future. You're teaching our future. Be proud of that. Reward yourself even when no one else does. So if you're watching this, you're probably either already an educator or starting out in education. We are the best at Googling things, looking things up. Um, what I want you to do is on your notepad, I want you to write challenge number one. Challenge number one. Challenge number one. Here's why. What self-care is to me may not be self-care to you. So under challenge number one, I want you to write down two things that make you happy, that calms you down, calms your nerves, that may or may not be something expensive depending on your specific situation. When I think about two things that make me happy or that calm me down, and these are two free things, I think about listening to an India Irie album or a Lauryn Hill album. And I also think about taking walks in nature. So these are my two things. Your two things can be as small like mine's or extravagant as you please. But I want you to create a schedule for every month 
in which you do either either one of these things or both of these things. After all, you're teaching our future. You deserve it. Now, while there are some teachers out there that say children have changed, and I'm guilty of saying this, um, I don't necessarily think that it's the children that have changed, but instead times that have changed and also parenting that has changed. Kids are, many kids are not being held accountable for their actions at home by their parents or their guardians. A child's school's experience should exist um, of the teacher and the parents on one accord trying to make sure that the student is being successful. It shouldn't be the teacher against the parent or the parent against the teacher unless one is really trying to harm the student, which is rarely ever the case. The students need to know that it's my parent and my teacher and me as well. We're on a team to make sure that I am su successful. So um, we have to create this culture in our classrooms. And let me tell you, when you have supportive uh, parents, it means the world when you can call a parent and they say, hey, put them on the phone. Or after they've talked to them, say, if I need to come up there, I can. Or if I need to send my mom or my dad or the child's dad, anybody up there, I can. It makes you feel like you have that support in the classroom and that is extremely important it makes the world of difference but let's face it all parents are not like this you have some good parents you have some not so good parents for whatever reason they have to be that way so we have to be creative in our attempts to increase students accountability so what can we do you might ask here are some ideas feel free to write these down the first idea is to first idea is to keep data folders data folders and use them with fidelity. So not data folders for you because I'm pretty sure you'll be keeping data. I'm pretty sure your um, school administrator or who's ever, whoever is on your leadership team they will have you keeping data, but making the students accountable for their data, making them keep up with it would be a great thing. Again, Google is our best friend. We know how to Google things. Some people also use Teachers Pay Teachers as a resource, and I think this is an awesome resource, a great resource, because these are educators out there just like you, just like me. And they put their spin on data folders for students. So use them, support them. Second thing, number two, we can celebrate growth every chance that we get. But here's the thing. We have to be consistent. We have to make it consistent. We also have to make it worth it to the students. Make sure it's something that they will appreciate. And then three, and this one is probably my favorite one. Take interest inventories, and, and you can do this at the beginning of the school year, and really involve the parents in being in on getting things or providing those experiences that the students provide you with on their uh, interest inventories. And um, do this um, when students meet their growth goals. So here's an example. Let's say a student indicates on his interest inventory that he loves to draw. Let's say that same student meets his or her or his growth goal on a benchmark assessment. Collaborate with the parent. Call that parent and say, hey, I want to let you know that Matt or Matthew met his growth goal for the benchmark assessment that we just took. I looked at his interest inventory. I saw that he likes to draw. So I had the idea of going and buying him this art set um, with a bunch of different art materials, paint, colored pencils, markers, sketching pencils, and then invite them to, to participate with you in this endeavor. So for example, say 
would you mind getting a sketchbook for the art set? Something as simple as, as that. Um, make their portion inexpensive so that they can go as extravagant or as small as they please. Some will be willing and some not so much. Regardless, you've built a bridge there that the students may very well recognize. And when they receive that art set and that uh, sketchbook from their parent, they will see that there was some type of communication. My mom and my dad worked with my teacher to get me this. And it will really push them to want to do good, to meet their growth goals every time. This would... You may find that your specific school may have expectations when it comes to holding children accountable. This would be a great interview question to ask a building administra administrator as far as if there are any school-wide strategies that are being in implemented that help students take accountability for their learning and even their behavior. To challenge number two. Reflection. I cannot preach to you the importance of reflection in education. It's extremely underrated and it's underrated the impact that it has on our practice, our day to day practice. Each year I keep this pink composition notebook and every time I have any type of revelation throughout my day, I write it down. And at the end of the year, I grow, th I go through and I look at all of the things that I have written down. And at the beginning of the next year, I go through that same journal, that same notebook and look at all of the things that I have written down. And it helps me to make changes to my next year. It helps me to make the decisions that I need to make for the next upcoming school year. And so this just allows me to just be better, to make changes that's better for me and better for the students. So on the daily, we should make time. We should be doing some type of reflection. It could be as simple as on your way home, just reflecting on a lesson, reflecting on the day, reflecting on a kid. What could I buy? What could have I? What could I have done better with this certain kid who may be misbehaving? Reflect on your colleagues. We need each other. So reflect on what colleague may need a text, what colleague may need a phone call, what colleague may need you to just pray for them, what colleague may need breakfast in the morning, um, what colleague may need a resource for a specific skill that you have. There are so many teachers out there who have created journals for educators, and so I'm an advocate for educators, so I recommend going to a Teachers Pay Teachers or any type of other um, website where teachers have put out their products because we know each other the best. So there are plenty of reflection journals out there for teachers. And once we make this a practice, a daily practice, it makes it easy for us to go and fix those things. Let's say you offend someone by mistake, but let's say you offend someone. When you are constantly reflecting on your day, you can go back and you can fix those things without letting a day go by, and, and there's no worries. But when we let time go by, you know, it's kind of harder to go back to a person and apologize for something or go and check on a person when a day has passed, a night has passed. So let's just get in the habit of reflecting. Reflection is a powerful practice, not only just for education, education, but also for life. So challenge number two, on your notepad, I want you to write challenge number two. And beneath it, write, I will find a reflection journal just for me. It'll make a big difference in your day to day practices. Building meaningful relationships. If there was one area that I felt was lacking or I needed to work on in relation to my experience in education, it would be building relationships with students. 
I'm sure we all know that the reasons we come to work is mostly for the students. It's not the pay, it's not the time off, it's not all of the perks that people think we have. It's the students. We want to teach them. We want to inspire them to grow and to be good human beings. We also realize that sometimes we're dealing with students who have not been held accountable in their lives. Their parents or guardians don't hold them accountable. And many people get into education with one thing in mind, and that's to teach. That was me. I had one thing in mind that was to teach, not to build relationships with students. I quickly found out, though, my first year of teaching that it's, it's all about building relationships with students. This can be easy for some people, but not so easy for others, depending on our um, our characteristics, depending on how we are, our personalities. Um, so how can we build relationships with students? So there are a plethora of ways to do it. Um, you can Google many ways, but I want to tell you one specific way. So as I mentioned earlier, we are not all extroverted people. I am not an extroverted teacher. I know many teachers who are not extroverted, but people think teachers are extroverted people. So when I was in school, I had this uh, teacher and she would allow us 10 minutes every class period. At the beginning of every class, we were to come in and immediately start working in our writing in our journals. And it would be a different prompt. Sometimes it would just be a free day. We could write whatever we wanted to write. But the next class period, she would have responded to every last one of our prompts. She was not an extrovert. She did not give out hugs every day. She did not give out high fives every day. She just was a person who cared. She just was a person who cared. And even if she didn't care, she made us feel like she did by just responding to our thoughts, responding to what we had to say. And this made a world of difference. So Figure out ways that you can build meaningful relationships with the students that you teach. Being flexible. Flexibility is extremely important. Luckily, I'm a pretty flexible person naturally, but that isn't everybody's story. You can say that I'm more of the um, kind of like the unbothered type. Things don't just get under my skin or get me in a bunch, as some people may say. I'm cool, calm, and collected for the most part, and I've even been told that I'm hard to read. And this is because I like to take some time to think before I just react to the things that are being thrown at me. And if you are an educator or getting into education, you know that things will get thrown at you left and right. I talked about earlier being pushed and pulled in so many directions. So it's important to be flexible in your day-to-day -day operations, your day-to-day -day thinking as a teacher. We have to find what works for us to be able to handle the many demands of being a teacher and educator. Be creative. For example, you could find a necklace or a bracelet or something that houses a message in it. So they have these necklaces or bracelets that open up and you can see the message. So it can be a constant daily reminder to just be flexible, to be uh, positive. You could also have something on your desk, such as a positive note to yourself, a personalized note to yourself, or even a picture of someone that helps you to stay positive throughout your day. One uh, thing that I thought of is finding you an accountability partner. Now, this accountability partner may be different from your best friend at the school. Find you someone who is just positive, who radiates positivity no matter the situation. This person may not be a part of the in crowd at your uh, specific job, but this person just may radiate positivity. Re befriend them and ask them for permission to just be your positive person to go to when you may be feeling negative. 
Ask them to hold you accountable when you may come to them with negativity. They, I'm pretty sure, they will appreciate it. They will recognize your efforts. They'll appreciate being recognized for being positive. But just remember what they're for. Um, they may not be the person that you're able to vent to after every meeting, but they may be just the right person to keep you flexible throughout the day, all because of their natural positivity. Remember Cindy? She wished she had a mentor to help her in the beginning years. Sometimes schools appoint you a mentor, sometimes they don't. Even if they don't, find you someone that helps you to get through the year with their positivity. These little things that we do, um, these are little things that we can do to make a big difference in how we are able to show up daily as educators. Technology can really be your best friend. If used effectively and strategically, um, technology can really help you throughout your day-to-day -day planning, your day-to-day -day classes, uh, meetings with parents. For example, Google Classroom is a great tool. Anytime you have an assignment, um, assign it through Google Classroom and this will allow the students to upload their work to Google Classroom, and it could be as simple as uploading a picture, even if you're using a worksheet, but it could be as simple uh, as uploading a picture or a screenshot of the work that they have done. And this makes sure that you have access to it at all times. So if you want to look at it when you get home, it's easier to pull out your phone and look at it or your laptop or iPad, whatever device you have, it's easier to pull it out there than to go through a folder of papers or a file cabinet of papers where you have to find a specific student. If you're in a meeting with a parent, it's easy to pull up something on your device rather than going through and trying to find everything that that child has completed in your classroom. There are programs out there that come really handy as an educator. Most of the times when you go to these specific jobs, when you go to these specific schools, they'll have a certain or certain programs that they purchase that they want you to use. What I suggest here is becoming skillful, becoming educated at using these programs. Most programs that are out there have these built-in classes or programs that you can go through and earn badges, you can earn certificates for being skilled, for being educated at that specific program. They'll even have like um, signature badges that you can download and attach to the bottom of your signatures in your email. And administrators, they see this and um, they may come and ask you for questions. And this could build your leadership capacity. Um, it could build your confidence in technology. But what I would suggest here strongly is to just get skilled at using these programs that your districts, uh, your districts purchase. And it'll make a big difference in how you're able to effectively use these programs. Student health and wellness. So this one is very subjective, but I wrote about it in my book and I won't go too in detail about this, but I encourage you to get the book, What About the Teacher and Educator's Path to Purpose? It's on Amazon. But in the book, I talk about how the foods we eat really affect us and specific to the children, it affects them and affects how they are able to show up in the classroom. I discuss ADD and ADHD. These are things that we have all probably dealt with at some point in our lives, whether it be from someone in our families or someone in our classroom. But the foods that we eat, I strongly believe, affect this. And I'll tell you this, we, we are what we eat. And this is a difficult statement to comprehend. But we are what we eat, and we have to at some point think about this 
as it relates to our students and even as it relates to ourselves. Being healthy overall entails so much, not only for us as educators, but for our students. We have to make students aware early of how health works, how it affects them. When I was young, I was very small. I was very skinny all the way up until college. I ate everything. Honey buns were my thing every single day, nightly to be exact. Not the very best thing to do. But it didn't affect me seemingly back then. I didn't see the effects. But it's extremely important that we dive into what we put into our bodies, the importance of what we put into our bodies, because it does affect us. And it it presents itself in how we are able to show up or how we are not able to show up, especially, especially students in a classroom. So Keep these things in mind, starting with yourself. Set the example for the students that you teach. Every single year, I have had a wide range of students in my classroom, from gifted students to inclusion students, some inclusion students that were also gifted students. So I remember, one year I was working in a small group. So it was me and maybe three or four other students. And I was teaching a math lesson or reviewing a math lesson. And I had this specific student that I was working with. Well, at the time there was this instructional coach and she came in my classroom and she sat down and she was not the most um, likable or approachable person. So as soon as she came in and sat down, my energy kind of shifted a little bit, but I was still in small group mode. So I was fine. I was just doing my thing, but I didn't necessarily like that she was in there, I must admit. But um, she came in, she sat down, and this firm person, I was expecting the worst from her. But as I was working with the student, I had reviewed a specific strategy on how to solve a problem. So I modeled it for him first and then I allowed him to solve a problem on his own well he disregarded what I had just done and he used a different strategy a strategy that I had taught them the previous uh, couple of days ago so it was days ago I had taught them several strategies to use and I, I always stress the importance of using the strategy that works best for you so at that specific moment he chose to do a different strategy I didn't fuss I didn't get mad. I was a little worried, but I didn't get mad. I kind of wanted him to use a strategy that I had just modeled for him, but I didn't I didn't stray him away from what he was doing. I just sat back and I watched and he was awesome. He did it great. So it allowed me the opportunity to dig deeper into that strategy with him and then we it just blossom from there we were able to have conversation about how the strategies relayed what made him use that strategy he was able to explain um with no problems and that lady that firm lady who was always just she came off as mean to other people when i saw her but she stopped me in the middle and she was just like hey great job um keep doing what you're doing this is excellent Guys, that was differentiation. Every kid really does learn differently. And we have, have to present them with the opportunities to be successful. So we have to find out ways to differentiate with each skill that you're teaching. Not one way works for every single student. So again, we have to be go-getters. We have to go out there and we have to find different ways to, to be able to present information but also to allow the students to present information back to us in different ways so that we can see what they really do or don't understand. There are a plethora of resources out there that can be used to help you do this, especially as new teachers. So go out there and find those resources. Parental support. When it comes to parental support, we sometimes have to really push for it, unfortunately. 
some parents are just distant parents when it comes to their child's education. It doesn't mean that they don't care. It doesn't mean that they're bad people or that they're bad parents. Some parents may have just had bad experiences when they were in school. So they really don't want to have anything to do with school. They may have had bad teachers when they were in school. Um, so they just don't want anything to do with the school environment. Somewhere along the lines, the importance of education, it has been lost. It's been forgotten. It's been left in the dust. So we have to win our parents back in a sense. Now at teachers, I know it feels like this is not our job. Parents should just care. I am in total agreement with that. But we're living in times where that isn't the case. And um, while they should just care, we do have a lot of power in helping them to be able to care. We have a lot of power in helping to win our parents back. So do administrators. So here's what I suggest. Y'all, the best thing in the world is to know. That's the best thing in the world is to know. Know how they want to show up in their kid's life. For example, if you have a parent who only wants to be responsible for bringing treats, make those treats dependent on the data. Make it dependent on the data. So when they're asking or when you're conveying um, what you need from them, ex ex explain the data and how this relates to the data. If a parent wants to help with classroom decorations, make them make classroom decorations for the data wall. You know what I'm saying? Make them in charge of creating a data board in your classroom. You can lay it out exactly how you want to and just allow them to come in each term and update it if need be. If a parent wants to just be motivation, allow them the opportunity to come in before benchmark assessments or to shoot a video before a test just encouraging a student. Um, another example could be if a parent just wants to read books to the children. If they like to read, they may be a librarian. Allow them the opportunity to come in and read books that focus on maybe a specific academic skill or a specific practice, such as perseverance or building classroom community. So be strategic about how you bring your parents and how you get your parents involved. It's almost like reverse psychology. Whatever it takes to get them involved, do it as long as it's legal, of course. But I think it'll make them really appreciate the work that we do with their children on a daily basis. Educator groups, lastly, but not least, I want you to surround yourself with like-minded people. You may find that the people that you work with on the daily may not have the same mindset that you have, and that's okay. I found that there are many people in the world who may not be in the same city that you are, who may not be in the same state that you are, but it's still good to network with these people, learn from these people. I invite you to pause this video and join my Facebook group, advocating for teachers using the QR code that is provided here. This is a safe place to just come and be inspired by other professionals who are like-minded and even who are not like-minded because we can all learn from each other. I have had the opportunity to network with a few people on this journey. One is Mr. Cedric Scott. I encourage you to find him on Facebook, y'all. He has this website that I found to be phenomenal. One of the things that I know to be true for many people of color, and that is that res representation is not as it should be. The curriculums that we sometimes use can be racially and socially biased. So on his website, I found it interesting that he had a product line called Melanated Mathematics. And the math content is relative to people of color. It's also uh, relative to the Common Core standards, so it's Common Core appropriate. His website is called ancientbabybrand.com. I also had the opportunity to meet with Mr. Jason Michael. 
I encourage you to find him on Facebook as well. He has a website called kidsfreezedance.com. That again is kidsfreezedance.com. This website focuses on the importance of getting kids to learn while moving. This is so important, especially with our younger students. I would have never met these people and learned about what they had to offer if I didn't network. So join and get to know people and what they have to offer that may benefit you in the classroom. I am elated that you all have made it this far. Um, you've made it to the end of the video, and I hope that you've learned at least one thing, at least one thing that you can take back and just be inspired to actually do in your classroom. Be inspired to go and research that specific thing, something that was discussed here today. So earlier in this session, I mentioned my book. This is a baby that I have recently birthed. It not only gives you my backstory a little bit about me, a little bit about me, but provides many jewels, many of which were talked about on the surface a little bit in today's session, in this video session. It's my hope to go on and create bigger and better resources, more practical resources for teachers. And you can support, you can be a part of that by purchasing this book to learn more about the needs of and the solutions for teachers all around the world, including you. Feel free to go to my YouTube channel or Facebook page to see videos that kind of give a little bit more detail about the book. My Facebook name is Allison Neal, and then my YouTube page name is The Educator Advocate. Stick around a few more minutes to see how you can get a free book. So I am a giver at heart. In fact, my love language is gifts. So before I tell someone something sentimental, I feel more comfortable giving to them. Please know that your comments, your words of encouragement, your inspiration, your reflection, even your words of criticism, they all mean the world to me. But if you are like me, feel free to give. I have the site to my cash app posted as well as a QR code for PayPal. So if you want, this is for you. So earlier I mentioned my book. I want to present you with an opportunity, a chance to win a free giveaway of a copy of my book, as well as a personalized happy, just to show you that I appreciate you and I appreciate your support. In order to enter into this giveaway, you should do three things. The first thing is to subscribe to my YouTube channel and leave a comment under this video detailing one thing that you may use from this video or something that you just found interesting. The second thing that I'd like for you to do is to join and make a post in the Facebook group that I talked about earlier. So there's a QR code earlier in this video that will take you to that Facebook group. Just introduce who you are and anything that you have to offer the community of education and of educators. And then the last thing that I like for you to do is to share this video with someone that you know, a friend, a colleague, anyone that you think may benefit from anything, any information in this video. Giveaway winners will be announced on July 14th. Again, video winners will be announced on Facebook and YouTube on July 14th. So be on the lookout for that. I look forward to building a community of awesome people with each and every one of you. I look forward to interacting with you. I look forward to learning from you. I look forward to hearing about your experiences and your expertise. One last challenge before I go. I challenge you, yes you, to go forth and be great.
figure out what makes you great. Go forth and just be that version of you. Be the best version of you that you can think of, that you can manifest into reality. Thank you again for tuning in and for supporting.